Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore. We're giving God a hand. He is wonderful, isn't he? And here we are, you know, I look around and there's people of all ages and sizes and colors and ethnicities. We're joined together by one thing, not because we have a lot of things in common. Hopefully we have some, but him, right? He's the one thing. And that's why we're here today. We're one in Christ. Let's pray together and just thank him for that. Father, we do thank you today that you are uh, present in our lives, that you uh, make a difference today and tomorrow and every day, God. Lord, we come to worship you just as we sang. Here we are to worship, God. So we ask that you'd clear our minds of uh, all the uh, in, just inconsequential things compared to you. They might be very consequential to us, but God, compared to you, you are almighty and all great. And we come to worship you today. So just uh, hear our, have our, receive our worship, God, our heart, our head, our mind. And Lord, be blessed. We want to bless your holy name. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated, if you would. It's great to see you today on this uh, cool morning in July in a heat wave. Uh, boy, it's nice in here, though, isn't it? Uh, we can stay till 12.15. If you look at the clock, that's about what time it says it is. We tried to fix it this morning. It's one of those atomic clocks that reads the time from the internet. It's not doing so good. So let's make that a goal that we'll be gone by then. How's that? <laughs> Scaring you, aren't I? Um, we, we just uh, want to welcome you today. Uh, if you're here for the first time or the 5,000th time, we're glad you're here. If you are here new, we're, we hope that you'll 
kind of connect with us. We want to connect with you and share your name and a little bit about yourself. You can do that. There's a card in the pew. It's called the Connect Card. And if you would fill that out, or if you're online at our website uh, or our app, you can find the uh, card there, a contact card. Love to have you. Please share it with us. We want to pray for you. There's a place to put some prayer needs as well if you have any. Uh, I'll receive all of those one way or the other. May God uh, bless you as you worship him today. A few announcements. We don't have a lot today. We want to pray for our young people who were just came back yesterday from a week of uh, Christian camp together. How'd it go, guys? Good? Amen. That's good. Really, we're glad to have get you that opportunity and that you took it. And I'm sure there's a lot that could be said that we're going to wait. We're going to have a week of sharing that the youth are going to do a youth service and share some of the things that God's doing. But he's not done yet for July because they leave tomorrow morning, to, today. They leave later today. <laughs> I can't believe that. Wow. To go on a mission trip for a week up in New Hampshire, right? And uh, we're just going to be praying for you, you folks. Would you just all stand that are going? We're going to pray right now for you, okay? Just stand. I'm not going to have you do more than that. If you're going on a mission trip, whether you're an adult or a youth, not everyone, but if you're going on a mission trip, you're an adult or a youth, anyone that's going, just stand, look around, try to remember these faces and pray for them this week. There's probably a few others as well. But let's pray right now. Father, we just ask that you would please just uh, go before them right now. We know that in every mission trip, there's all kinds of variables that can't be planned for, but we know you've planned for them all, so help every person, young and old, to just uh, be ready to uh, instantly uh, follow whatever you lead them into t this week, God. And we just pray for our leaders, Pastor Jose and all the other leaders and all the young people, we just commit this to you. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Um, a reminder that our children's ministry, our midweek children's ministry, Treehouse, they're having a fun night, August 3rd. I don't know what it is, but it's a lot of fun, okay? <laughs> so if you wanna get involved, uh, check it out at our website, uh, and you can get more information, okay? Uh, in the evening service, we're doing a, a series by, uh, how come I, Matt Chandler. I, I know his name well, and I forget it every time I'm up here. Matt Chandler. And we're, we're just starting off. Last week, he introduced it. Uh, and you can come here at 6 o'clock and, and be part of it, or you can connect online by going to our, our website, the calendar, and you'll see the Zoom link, and you can come right in and do it from home if that suits your needs better. Okay. Do we have anything else? Really thankful for all those that are leading. Thankful for Darren to begin playing. Darren, praise the Lord. We're glad you're doing this. Hey, let's stand together and worship our God. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before.
is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. God, thank you that anywhere we are, you are there. Thank you that no matter how we feel, you're there. God, I pray that this morning we draw closer to you and we just learn, we don't just learn but we remember and we know how indescribable and how amazing you are. God, remind us of that this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. From the of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky. 
sky and you know them by name you are amazing God incomparable and unchangeable God incomparable unchangeable you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same you are amazing are your tabernacle glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy you are holy holy the universe declares your majesty you are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and this time we've had to worship this morning through song. God, thank you for bringing us together into this place. 
pray that we never take it for granted and we understand that the God of wonders, the indescribable, unchangeable, incomparable God who created the entire universe and everything in it, who decides to care for us, who made us in his image, who did an incredible thing of giving us everything that we took for granted and continue to, and yet still gave everything in your son to save us, though we don't deserve it. God, that is not fair. That we get that gift. But thank you for giving it. I pray that we never take it for granted. And we thank you for it this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For junior worship, children. If you look too old, I'm going to ID you if you leave. As we uh, pray together, I just want to share some things quickly and then we'll pray. We already uh, started praying for our, our young people and the mission trip as they go on it, but please remember all the ministries of our church. Uh, you know, nothing that we do really depends on us alone, does it? Depends on God uh, putting his power and spirit into it, you know, and guiding us and directing. And we should serve wholeheartedly, but then we depend on the Lord for the results, right? Amen. And uh, let's pray for that today. We have a world that needs our prayers. Many of us uh, know of people with needs. We have a few people that came home from trips and have COVID and they're recovering nicely and we're glad for that. And uh, we hope to see them back soon. And let's pray together. Father, we just uh, thank you so much. You are a God of wonders. We'll, I hope we'll see that even more from your word today as we open it up and think about the fact that you have given us this word that reflects your glory and couldn't have been given to us without a God like you who is uh, in charge of everything and stands behind everything, God, and we just praise you for that. And you stand behind our, our lives uh, and you, you choose to help us. And God, we thank you for that. Be with those who are sick those who are going through trials, whether it be loss of uh, loved ones or uh, just all kinds of things that we experience on this earth, Lord. It's a fallen earth and we live in it and yet we have uh, hope and we have uh, redemption in Jesus. So we're so thankful for that. And God, we see your hand of mercy so many times in our lives and in our, around us, God. Please be with our world, be with our president who has COVID right now and uh, help him to recover his family. We pray for others in, in all over the world that are experiencing these things. We pray for the Afghan, I'm sorry, uh, Ukraine and, and uh, we lift up that terrible situation and ask that you would help to bring it to a, a close soon. And certainly all the other areas of the world uh, and, I, Afghanistan came out of my mouth and certainly we could pray for that too without any hesitation. God, we pray for those who are blinded uh, because of uh, false religions that keep them from even hearing the gospel. Uh, but yet, Lord, you get it through and we pray that you will continue to do that. Be with missionaries uh, who, who serve you, God, and they depend on your help every moment because they know they can't do it alone. So we just uh, commit them to you in prayer. Father, be with us today. I pray every single person that's here would keep their ears and eyes open for you to speak to them this morning. I, I believe you have something to say to me, and uh, I pray that I can share some of that with, uh, with those around us, God. This is such an important topic, even though it's not one we focus on a lot. Uh, we need to at times, because we need to have the confidence that we can certainly have as believers in your word and in you. Thank you, Father. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. If you'll take your Bibles or uh, your 
your Bible apps or whatever you have and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and honestly, we are going to start here. We're not going to stay here. That's unusual for me, but we're going to cover a lot of verses today, and I would encourage you to take notes, especially when we get to the next section after my long introduction, and uh, uh, I think you're going to want to take some notes this morning, especially the scripture verses I'm going to give you later. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and it's really the first part we're focusing on today. It's all good, but you can't focus on everything. All scripture, that's, that's what we have in your hand, all scripture is breathed out, that's how this version puts it, inspired by others, God breathed by others. Same idea, breathed out by God, that's this book, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God and the woman may be complete, equipped for every good work. <clears throat> is the Bible, this book we just read about in 2 Timothy, is the Bible believable? Does the scripture contradict the facts of science? Many in our world, including, I'm sure, some of you right in this room today, and I, I, I don't fault you for that, many of you wonder about that. I, I think uh, many think that answer is actually already settled, and they don't have to even think about it. Um, <clears throat> today and next week, I want to talk to you on this subject. Is the Bible believable? And especially about how science and scripture relate or don't relate. <clears throat> Obviously, we live in a society where, where um, <clears throat> that wants to say that science contradicts scripture or even more that, that scripture contradicts science. Scripture is primitive, they would say, and uninformed and lacks the sophistication necessary for us to believe that it is really the book of truth that it claims to be. Okay, or so the story goes, something like that, many different ways. It's a popular thing. We all know that. We all live in this world. It's a popular thing to pit the Bible against science. Let me be clear about something as we begin. I'll come back to this more next week. But, um, but I, I want to say something about it this week. Science can say nothing definite about the origins of life. Only theories at that point. And I'll explain that more. Science can say nothing factual about how the universe that we sang about came into existence. Because science is basically observation and experiments. I know that's a, a, a real summary and uh, generalization, but it's basically true. We'll, we'll also go into that more. In other words, you look at something, you test it, and you draw conclusions. That's science. Science is guided by something called the scientific method. If anyone who's made it to sixth grade uh, probably has learned about the scientific method, okay? Uh, every high schooler learns about it. You form a hypothesis, which is an educated guess. Then you come up with a way to test that hypothesis. And you remove or you try to remove all the other variables in that test. Okay, and then you repeat multiple tests, and then you look at the results and you draw conclusions. Was my hypothesis correct? Now, science cannot prove any historical events, any, okay? That's not what it does, including how life began, by the way. You can't observe the past, you can't repeat the past, you can't perform experiments on the past. Science can't prove scientifically how life originated or developed. Uh, I'm not saying that because they oppose what the Bible says in those points. No, they do, but that's not why I'm saying it. But because there's no scientific method to test for those things. So for science to say anything about creation is for science to be, can I say, very unscientific. Um, no one observed creation. No one was there except, of course, the creator, if you give him that right okay we have only one account of creation where someone could say i was there i observed it but i also did it and that's god as the eyewitness and we have a record of that in scripture but do we believe it well back to we're going to get back to that but today's question is a little different does science make the bible unbelievable because that's where we got to start we can't believe the bible until we think it's believable 
I think you're going to see today that the opposite is actually true, and I hope that shocks some of you. I love science. I kind of was a science major in college. If anything science does, if, if it does anything, it actually sets the Bible apart as a book unique among books as being true. Let me, let me approach it. Here's how I'm going to approach it this morning. Whoever created the universe, I'm going to set a really high bar. Whoever created the universe and everything in the universe understands perfectly how it works. Doesn't that make sense? That's what we believe. He created the universe. We just sang about it. And if he does, he understands everything perfectly how it works. Uh, he has to if he's the creator. And he didn't need to wait for science to explain something, how something works in the world, for him to understand it. He understood it already. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to make points about this. And since the whole of Scripture claims to be the inspired revelation of God, that's where we began, claims to be true, claims to be accurate, the Bible claims to be authoritative, it claims to be God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3, 16, then we should reason that it would be accurate because God is not only a powerful creator, but he's infinitely perfect. He never lies, and he always tells the truth. Everything he speaks is truth. Okay, the creator knows, and the creator has revealed truth on the pages of his revelation, which you hold in your hands, have in your phone, wherever you have it, he knows. Okay, now look, the Bible is not a textbook on science. Let's not go there. But whenever the Bible intersects with the material world that science can measure, it speaks truth. I hope you'll get that. I'm going to say it again a little later. The Bible doesn't speak in scientific jargon or language. It's because it's not a science book. But whenever God's word says something that relates to something science can measure, we find it's true, which is an amazing thing. For example, he knows the earth is spherical. He knows that the earth turns on its axis. He knows it's suspended on nothing. Think of the centuries of pre, in pre-scientific times when the Bible was actually written, when human beings would find those concepts completely foreign and even unthinkable. He knows it's sweep, that the earth is sweeping through space in a fixed rotation and the orbit on a more massive scale than we could ever really even imagine even today. Whoever created the universe knows all the galaxies. He created them, all of them, the staggering reaches of space, the countless stars and galaxies beyond any possible observation. To infinity and beyond. I think that's Buzz Lightyear, but it sure sounds a lot like Yogi Berra, okay, um, if you think about it. He knows the meteorological cycles. He knows the cycles of water. He knows the facts of chemistry. He knows all about biology. So if he wrote a book, if he wrote a book, this creator who knows all those things, this book would be accurate whenever it touches on those. Now, that's a pretty high bar I'm setting, but I want you to see that right now. Uh, writing this book would have been the easy part, right? If you made the whole creation. It would be consistent with the facts. I think I can get rid of that. Can I get rid of that? I think because he created it all. He authored it all. So let me take that a little bit further before we get into some details. For example, he would never say that the moon is higher than the sun, right? Or that the moon has its own light. He would never say the earth is flat and triangular, composed of seven stages, one of honey, one of sugar, one of butter, one of wine, and so on. He would never say that the earth sits on the heads of elephants who produce earthquakes when they shake. But all of those things are contained in the Hindu writings about origins, okay, and the earth. So we know those books are not from the creator. The Hindu Upanishad says, and I quote, the sun is the source of all the energy in the universe. We know that's wrong. That's not true. Furthermore, the creator would never say there's only 13 organs in our body that can cause someone to die. I wish that were true, but there's so many more than that, okay? Uh, but that's what the Taoist holy book claims. 
The Creator would never say earthquakes are caused by wind moving water and water moving land. But that's what the Buddhist holy book says. The Creator who knows everything and always speaks truthfully would never say that Adam fell into sin that men might have joy. That's, that's a warped expression of Adam's arrival, but that's what 2 Nephi says in the Book of Mormon. It also says in the Book of Mormon that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. We know that's not true. The, see, the one who created everything would never say this as well, that man is not made up of brain, blood, bones, and other material elements. Yes, we are. Man is incapable of sin, sickness, and death. But that's the claim of Christian science uh, in the book, Science and Health and the Key to Scriptures. So we know that whoever wrote that book is not the creator. I, I think I've made my point about other books. And here's my point. That, and he, here's the one I want you to say. I'm not really talking about those. Other. If the Bible similarly makes any of those kind of totally inaccurate claims about the world the creator made, then we should likewise conclude the Bible is not true either. Doesn't that make sense? That's a pretty high bar for a book that was written in pre-scientific times. In a pre-scientific time, I think we would expect that books written then would include a lot of errors about material things. But we don't see that in the Bible. That's not what we see in the Word of God. I'm going to show you that. If God is anything, anything, he's the ultimate information expert, right? He, since everything that lives is based on coded, implanted information, we're going to get to that next week, and that's so fascinating. You know, the, the world is so incredibly complex, and it's all run by information, you know? Uh, coded information, every living thing. So unlike all the other books mentioned, and the Bible never says things that aren't true. I already said this already, but it bears repeating. The Bible is not a textbook on science, but whenever the Bible intersects with the material world, it speaks truth. That's my main point today. The Bible's true and accurate when it speaks scientifically as much as when it speaks spiritually. We usually focus on the spiritual aspects. Today we're not but I hope you know why, because you need to have the confidence in Scripture so you can accept what it says about our spiritual lives. True science has no uh, argument with Scripture. Hope you, I bet you don't know that you believe that if you just hear what the world says. True science has no argument with Scripture. Uh, the word science simply means knowledge. That's why when we talk about God, one of the titles we give him is omniscient, which is actually putting two words together. One is the word science, and one is the word omni, meaning all knowledge. God is the one with all knowledge. He's all-knowing. And we, we find knowledge, okay? True science has no argument with Scripture because the Creator is the author of all knowledge. And He knows the way things are because He made them the way things are. In fact, what you, what you do find is that the Bible, the Word of God, actually is, is in some ways ahead of science, okay? Far ahead of science. And what I mean by that is the Bible describes described things accurately so long ago before humans ever discovered the same things through scientific methods. Science is not evil. Some of us Christians think it is. It's the discovery of the intricacies of God's design in the world that he made. When it discovers truth, it's discovered God's truth. How many of you have seen this phrase, raise your hand, all truth is God's truth? You've seen that before, right? Do you believe that? I do. All truth, no matter where you find it, if it's true truth, the world is getting away from that idea, is God's truth. Let me get a little more specific now, and here I hope you'll take some notes, okay? If you just look up in the clouds and you see the sky, and you see the clouds in the sky, and every once in a while rain falls out of those clouds, and then the rivers and streams form, and you, then you see an ocean. By, 
just by looking at all that, you wouldn't necessarily know where the rainwater came from and, and why the rivers and oceans don't, rivers and streams don't fill the oceans until they overflow, you know, and fill the earth. You know, that was actually hard for human beings to figure out uh, for centuries. In fact, until the 17th century, the main belief was they believed in subterranean reservoirs that were in the middle of the earth. And, and there were huge inexhaustible reservoirs of water and that's where the springs came from and they just kept bubbling and bubbling up you know, out of those subterranean reservoirs. They didn't believe that there was any way to replenish the water in those reservoirs, so they must be huge things under the ground. Well, men like Maria and Peralt and Haley from England came along in the 17th century and they opened up the modern concept that we call the hydrological cycle, where water we know is taken up, evaporates from the ocean, it's brought into the clouds, it's redeposited, it rains, it seeps onto the earth, and that creates the reservoirs and waters in the ground, as well as runs off and fills the streams and rivers and back to the ocean and the cycles over and over again, the hydrological cycle. We all know that one. The 17th century, they began to understand that in the 17th century. They could have read Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, and started to see that, where it says, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All the waters flow into the sea, it says, but they don't just keep filling the sea. They return to the earth and then back again. Job, even more clear, probably the, Job is probably the first book ever written Job chapter 36 says, verse 27 and 8, For he draws up the drops of water, they distill his mist in rain, which skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. The hydrological cycle. You see, if God made the whole hydrological cycle, he could explain it, couldn't he? You know, never, mind, never once does the Bible say that the waters are stored deep inside the earth, you know, or some other incorrect thing. There's no conflict with science there. Absolute accuracy. Let's move to another one. We're going to do a couple of them today. Astronomy. I, I love astronomy. We all do because you could see what's out. You look at the stars. It's fascinating. The wonder of it. It's staggering. You know, modern views on astronomy didn't even begin to replace the old ideas until, again, the 17th century or so. The old idea was made famous by Ptolemy, who was a Greek philosopher, who said that the Earth, he described the Earth as immovable and flat, and it, it was in a hollow globe, you know, which was the sky, it was like a big bubble, and, uh, and the stars were stuck on the inside of the bubble, like little jewels, I keep thinking of the movie The Truman Show, if you ever saw that, <laughs> kind of had that kind of idea. There was a whole, that was the whole ball game right there. Of course, they never got to the question of what's outside the bubble, but that's another story. They used to say this, they used to say that if you're dumb enough to sail through the gates of Pericles, which is the rock of Gibraltar, you'll fall off into nothingness. But... Time went on, people sailed, and people sailed far beyond Pericles, the Rock of Gibraltar. They went around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, came up the other side, and that theory was on really shaky ground. Then. But that was the accepted popular view until the early 1500s when Copernicus came along and presented the view that the Earth was not fixed, but it was in motion. And they thought he was out of his mind. Then came men like Brahe and Tycho and Kepler and Galileo in the 17th century, and they really gave birth to what we think of as modern astronomy. One of the most amazing facts of modern astronomy is the essentially infinite size and the variety in the physical universe. It, the thing that they discovered was that there's no end to the universe. You know, it just keeps going. It isn't this hollow ball that's filled with a bunch of things stuck on the inside, but it's endless. This is a staggering finding. You know, Job 22, 12, the oldest book in the Bible again, says it like this, Is not God high in the heavens? See the highest stars, how lofty they are. 
And that word lofty means far off, how far off they are. It, there's a recognition here that the stars are far off. They're not just stuck on something. Jeremiah went further. He made statements to the fact that the solar system was a vast and a distant thing. People didn't believe that then, but the Bible said it. In, in Jeremiah 31, 37, thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and if the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. This verse tells us that the heavens can't be measured. Immeasurable. Jeremiah 33, 22, just go a little further. As the host of heaven, those are the stars, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. He says there's no way, there's no way to number the stars. There's no way. It's vast. It's immeasurable. But you know, before the telescope was discovered, Invented again in the 17th century, Hipparchus said, he said, I did the count. There's 1,022 stars. Final answer. <laughs> Ptolemy disagreed with him. He said, you're wrong. There's 1,056 stars. You missed a few. Today, our scientists tell us there's over 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. And how many billion galaxies are there? The Bible knew all that. You, know, you, you can't measure them. It says they're immeasurable. You know, they're more new, innumerable than the sands of the sea. Can you imagine gathering up all the sand in all of the, the beaches on, in the whole world and counting that? And you wouldn't even have the number of stars that God created. Can't be measured. The Bible said it couldn't be measured. And you know, science has also discovered that stars are not all the same. There's all kinds of different heavenly bodies out there. Early scientists believe everything out there was the same thing, okay? They were all the same. Whatever they were, it was the same. They found today that there's infinite numbers and varieties and sizes, and scientists are busy cataloging all those varieties. Do you realize 1 Corinthians 15, 41 told us that? It says this, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from stars in glory. Star differs from star in glory. Now, all the Bible has to do, stop and think, all the Bible has to do was one time say, all the stars are the same. Or any of these things we just said, you know, say something the opposite. If it did that, it would be wrong. But it doesn't do that. It never makes a mistake. Written far earlier in time than the scientific discoveries or even the popular beliefs of the days it was written, God knows as much about the stars as he does about salvation. Another thing that's interesting is orbits. You know, it, it always fascinated me as a kid. You remember, I, we're all in school and the teacher had the big ball in the center and the Earth and Venus and everything going around, rotating. And, and I used to think that's pretty amazing, but that's not even the beginning of it. When you stop and realize that everything in the universe is in orbits, and the whole universe is orbiting, the whole thing is going around and around in this mad panicking thing, it's staggering. Everything in the universe is moving, it's going somewhere. But at the same time, science has discovered that these orbits are so absolute that they can be predicted to the very minute. It's amazing. You know, they can predict an eclipse years before it's going to happen, can't they? To the very hour. You could, get a, you could go online and you could type in your birth date and get the stars wherever you are on the, on the planet. You can see what the stars look like that night that you would have been able to see. You could look at the... And, I've done that, and I've looked at the day Jesus was born, you know, to see what they looked like, because they're absolutely, you know, God has made it that way. The orbits of those planets are absolutely constant in spite of the movement of everything. Science was staggered when it realized this. It shouldn't have been. 
God knew it. Jeremiah 31, 35, 36 says, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this, look at this, if this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. The fixed order of the stars. God said it won't change. And it doesn't change. I'm telling you, you can measure this stuff because God is upholding all those things at absolutely perfect pace so that they can be charted mathematically. I can't, but someone can. It's staggering. It's all there in Jeremiah. Now, you might say, did Jeremiah actually understand what he was saying? Of course he didn't know all that he was saying. But boy, God did. And, and, and that's even a greater confirmation of Scripture, isn't it? Did you notice that these intersections that we've been reading about in the Bible with scientific details, that, that the science is never the main point? Okay, they're, they're there to illustrate and to uh, make a, a spiritual point, a spiritual reality about God's plan. But the, here's the thing, though. Whenever he does that, he does it with great accuracy. That's God. He deserves a hand, doesn't he? He just deserves a hand. Give him a hand. He's amazing. <laughs> amazing God. Now, the subject of this book is not science. It's redemption. It's redemption. But if God is so clear about the material world, you know, don't you think he's trying to tell us something that we better pay attention to what the main point of this book is all about? his desire to redeem us and make us his, to give us life. Geology, here's another one. We'll go quicker now. Geology has a sub-science called geodesy, and that's the study of the shape of the earth. We know that the earth is basically a sphere, right? That it's basically round. Now, the ancients thought what? We already said it. The earth was flat, right? It was flat. They said that if you sail far enough, plunk, you go off into nothingness. Centuries earlier, Isaiah told them that it wasn't. It says, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. I just love it. It says, he sits on the circle, and that Hebrew word actually means sphere. He sits on the sphere of the earth. Take physics and even cosmo, cos, not cos, not cosmetics, but cosmology. I think that's how you say it for a moment. Take gravity. Let's just say that. Take gravity. In Hindu mythology, the earth is supported by four elephants who stand on the back of a big turtle. Pretty big turtle. Pretty big elephants. It wasn't till Isaac Newton in the 17th century discovered that the, gravi the gravitational laws were, and he discovered the gravitational laws. Yet, unlike Hindu beliefs, the Bible said the right thing all along. Way back in Job, it says, he stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. There's gravity in operation. Our world hanging in space. Amazing. Not so amazing if God is God, though. And the Bible is authored by God. we got to stop. Are you getting the point? It's a great point, isn't it? There's many other things we could talk, talk about. Biology, human physiology, and so on. But in every field, when the Bible mentions it, it gets it right. The Bible's not a science book, but it's not anti-scientific. It's confirmed by science. You can't use science to prove the Bible, nor can you use the science to prove any historical book of history. But known scientific facts could certainly disprove the claims of the Bible to be inspired, God-breathed, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Like all other books of similar claim, the Bible stands apart. It doesn't. Have people misinterpreted the Bible 
at times? Yes, they have. And we'll, maybe we'll have time to get into that, but sure, they've done that. But that's human error. That's not God. Next time, we're going to tackle some amazing things in modern, more modern science and that only further confirm that we can trust the Bible. You know, we'll talk more about what I'm going to call pure science, soft sciences like sociologies and all that, uh, and theoretical science. And it's that last category out of which all the items of contention with the Bible arise, like evolution and the origins of life, all out of that theoretical box, okay? But like I said, theoretical science is not really science done in a scientific way. It's theory. It's unproven. Next time, we'll even look at DNA and information, which I think is really fascinating, and how that is really putting a rift into the scientific world about how things really must have happened or maybe couldn't happen as they thought they did because of the volume of information taken, okay? Now, that won't filter down to your high school class when they talk about these things or even maybe your college uh, 101 class, but it's there. We'll talk about it. The Bible, we're going to close. Paul, if you want to be ready. The Bible's not, a, I've got 1210. I know that's wrong. Oh, we're doing good. The, Bi <laughs> the Bible's not a book of science, but science should make you pay attention. It, it should, the science should make you pay attention to its real message, which I already told you was redemption. Most of the verses we looked at only mention the items you know, that we observed as illustrations or background to the main text, the main point that, that the Bible was trying to make at that time. What is the main point of the Bible? It's that God loves this world. He created it. He loves it. He loves it, but he also knows it's a fallen world. This world fell into sin, you know, and sin has cursed this world. We'll maybe even look at that next week. And it's cursed every one of us because of the sin that entered into our lives. And God knows that we need to be redeemed from our sin. That's the story of the Bible. We need forgiveness or else we will stay separate from God forever. That's why God sent his only son, Jesus. Jesus is the main story and his redemptive love for the world. God sent Jesus to take our place on the cross and died in our place for our sin. And by his death and his resurrection, he paid for our sin and he, he offers every single person, you and me, new life, forgiven life, life with God, eternal life. He redeemed the world back to God, one person at a time. He's waiting for each of us to receive this gift undeserved gift but we receive it by putting our faith and trust in Jesus to become a follower to become saved what do you need to do you need to ask him for it ask just ask he's waiting to give it just ask receive the gift the scripture says we ask God things when we pray why don't you pray and ask God for forgiveness Thank him for what Jesus did on the cross. Put that prayer up on the screen, would you please? This is a prayer you could ask God through. Dear God, thank you for giving us a Bible that we can trust. You believe that? We have a Bible that we can trust. Thank you for its message of redeeming love. Today, I respond asking for forgiveness for my sin and a new life with you. I am ready to put my faith and trust in Christ. Amen. Let me just ask you, as you look at that prayer, today, are you ready to put your faith and trust in Christ? It's the most important thing any of us could ever do. And if you've already done it, you know that. And you're just pushing, pulling for the person maybe near you or next to you or in this room that needs to do that. Because th their life will be a better life, a changed life. Are you ready to do that today? Let's bow our heads. We're going to close with this prayer, and then we're going to be dismissed. I'm going to lead us verbally with this prayer that you could pray silently, but your heads are bowed right now. Eyes are closed. 
If, you, if you're one of those that's ready to put your faith in Christ, would you just raise your, slip your hand up for a moment that I could see it and just say, I'm going to pray for you even as you leave today. God will help you with that. I'm going to pray for you today. I'm going to lead us in this prayer now. Dear God, thank you for giving us a Bible that we could trust. Thank you for its message of redeeming love. Today, I respond, asking for forgiveness from my sin and a new life with you. I am ready to put my faith and trust in Jesus. Amen. Amen. You could look up. I hope God blessed you today in everything we did. But, you know, it's what we did together. We worshiped God. God was here, I believe. Now go. God's with you as you go. Now let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Um, pray for the youth as they get ready to go. And uh, for any that might want to attend the service tonight, God bless you in that too. Let's sing this together as we close. If you have a public commitment to make, I'll be in the front. You come if you need prayer. If you want to share that you've prayed to receive Christ, come and share that with me this morning. Lord of all creation Of water, earth, and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. You're Lord. You are dismissed. Go with God's peace.